But the word revolution in this in this story is twofold. One of the obvious like revolution, let's change everything, but also like revolving, like, like a cycle, like spinning well, in it, a cycle. It, it Hence, why in the opening sequence they're spinning. It means something <laughs> different to each of them. Like, like they they each have their own reason for fighting. They each have their own reason they want to see the castle. They each have their own reason why they want the rose bride. So it's almost like you know. Like, I feel like maybe, like, that's one of the clues that this is all horseshit, because, like, nobody can even agree on what the fuck their goal is, and yet they're supposed yeah. to be this organized council, but it's like, no one knows what's up! Nope, everybody just wants what they want, and are controlled by that. And Utna's just being there like, you guys are dummies. I'm great! I'm <laughs> Utna! <laughs> Well, she keeps winning, so... Yeah, I mean, no, she... She's well, I mean, she, she cheats every fucking time. <laughs> well, it's kind of, of hard to say what Dio. cheating is, because, I mean... We'll she's get... blessed by the power of Dios. And I guess we'll get into later how... I guess maybe we'll we'll, we'll we'll try to delve into what the fuck that could possibly mean to anybody <laughs> later. But... <laughs> I'm trying my hardest to get through this shit. And I'm, I'm, I really am trying my hardest to stay calm, but, like... I think we got through the first arc, and then there yes. was the clip show that had the inner, like it was interspaced with the first things, clip show. Like it was interspaced with scenes of the prince, and I think it was supposed to be like the idea of the prince and Akio talking. Like I couldn't. Yes. Okay. And then they were looking at windows that represented each of the fights that Udna had. Yeah, yeah. and what those fights like sort of meant, and to the people who fought them, and. I such literally just such. watched those parts. I skipped around. Yes, I did too. Yeah, that, that's the weird thing with this show, and I guess it's one of the other things that's subverted, is that it has clip shows in which shit actually happens <clears throat> yes. in between the clips. Yes. Um, the final clip show had a thing so important, I nearly threw my laptop out of the fucking window and then chased <laughs> after it. I was so furious. And not like the the, the like not the like, same furious it, as that you were at the end of the show. Just no, this is like an emotional investment furious to like I can't believe they did that to me personally. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, how dare you defile my Utena Sama? <laughs> yes, like, that was Nikki. That was exact because like, uh, okay. And then the next arc was called the Black Rose Saga, and it introduces this guy who's. Probably a ghost called Mamiya. Spoilers, he's a ghost. Whatever. I mean, I didn't um, pick up on that. Like, I just thought, oh, there's some guy who just suddenly appeared and, like, they're having him become part of the Rose Bride system. Okay. Okay. And, I didn't um, like and this. Basically, and basically what that introduces is that this world and, like, the reality that people perceive in it is manipulable. Like, this... Not only is End of the World telling these teenagers to fight, but... Somebody is capable of controlling the, these things and making a building appear as if it, it is not burned down when it is burned down. And that there is this guy walking around when he does not exist. And all this crazy stuff. And that there's and people alter, pulling strings. And altering people's memories. because And they, altering people's memories. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that could be tying into the themes of like fairy tales and uh, beliefs and stuff like that. So... But I think it's also just show this world of Otori Academy, the school they're in, is a constructed world. And it seems to be constructed for the purpose of these duels, even more so now with this other guy. So this guy comes in and he, for reasons, is try for his own personal bullcrap, is trying to replace the ro kill the Rose Bride and replace it with this kid that he knows who's also a ghost, but is being played by <laughs> Anthe for the sake of manipulating this ghost guy. <laughs> like, the what ghost the forgot what is going on? The ghost forgot he was a ghost, is what I got from it. <laughs> he forgot he was dead. <laughs> oh, End so of the it's, world um... brought this dude to life just so he could use him to further these duels along. Some fucking sixth sense shit. Yeah, and, you know, whatever. And he's, like, with the group of a hundred duelists, and... We all seem to think that uh, Utna's going to have to fight a hundred different guys with the same I wouldn't have put scene. it past them for a minute. <laughs> uh. 
But so they, in this, I'm exhausted, you guys. And like, okay, so the, yeah, the one I thing, am too. One thing I noticed in the reused stock footage where they select a coffin, it's the same coffin. So is he switching them out and or just moving corpses into the same coffin? He's kicking into the fire every day. It's the same it's, hole. It's the only one he can reach because all the other ones are like on the goddamn ceiling. Like it's a yeah. Yeah, like poorly the, designed room. Like, it's so room. haphazardly. Like who? T- I hate it. This is my least favorite arc. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's I didn't, dumb and inconsequential because they don't even they don't even remember what happened in the end. Like the character arcs that go in, that they go into are kind of interesting, but they're like with all the side characters. Like they take one character that's important to each student council member's story, and then they get the power to fight when the uh, for the Rose Bride, like because yeah. they're brainwashed. I I liked all the character stuff that led up to the stupid duel. Like, yeah. I mean, that that scene at the end of that episode where, you know, Wakaba gets home and she's like, oh, Sayanchi-san. And, and like, they, and you see that they're together. Like, that's another thing. Like, I got super mad and it hit me because it's like an effective character piece. It's like, oh, fuck, Wakaba, you're better than this. I know you're better than this. Why can't you see that you're better than this? Like, that shit all worked for me. You know, oh, yeah, she, 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 she had boring. no... She had no reason to, like, dislike Sionji because he was still, like, the student council, like, he was the ladies' man that she was going after at the very beginning. And no, but she, she, didn't... she had a reason to dislike him because he publicly humiliated her. Oh, right. In, like, the first goddamn episode. <laughs> yeah. That, no, actually, that was the main reason why Utno dueled Sionji was not because of Anthony, oh. but because of, of Wakaba. Yeah, that's why the yeah, first you're right. battle. Wow. Yeah, you're right. The first battle was, was called friendship because Utno was fighting for her friendship with Wakaba. She fights yeah. for her friends. And and, <laughs> and 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 this is a bit of a uh, a diversion, but I think it is relevant to something and it's something I picked up on. And it's the nature of Wakaba and Utno's relationship. And it's one thing I've heard from people who are more familiar with Yuri and that kind of stuff is that there's like a dichotomy with Yuri relationships. Mm-hmm. And that they're either like really manipulative and and, and like Baba Yaga esque, or uh, they're played as like really childish and inconsequential and and and, uh, and, and sort of trivial. Mm-hmm. And and like in a- anime, you usually see those as the only kinds of lesbian relationships. And I definitely saw the latter in Utna and Wakaba as like some yeah. kind of thing that they were pretending to do while they looked for real relationships in, in men. Yeah, that's and, uh, the feeling yeah. I got. And w- once I, once I, uh, I made that connection, I wasn't as into it anymore. Cause it's well, like, that this... has a, a cultural yeah, I, I, I'm history sure it, to it. Actually. I'm sure it does. I mean, it was almost encouraged for young girls in Japan that like, yeah, you can, it's, it's part of, it's part of growing up. It's part of the natural girl's lifespan to sort of have romantic crushes on her friends when she's young. But then when she becomes an adult, she wants to be with dudes. Like, that's part of her growth. And, like, that's it's totally cool if you're, like, in school and you think you, like, hold hands with your best friend. But, like, that's just you being in high school and gals and being pals. Being a kid. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the, it's just a phase shit as like an expected phase. It's, it's super homophobic and gross and I hate it. Yep. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I feel like there are other parts of the show that seem like, I mean, that. they do love each other. Just, it's not like they want to kiss. Yeah. Oh, yeah no, they, I they never got any really legitimate, each other. yeah, I never got a legitimate romantic vibes from Moon. No, it's just I mean, that they no, no. really like each other. They're best yeah. friends. Uh, I, mean, I feel like I feel like maybe Wakaba maybe Wakaba was one of ha, like it, the, like not for real just as a goof like realistically I think maybe Wakaba sometimes would just look at Uten and just be like fuck I wish I were gay <laughs> like I think maybe she has that vibe about it like well, God Uten is so that fucking she perfect wanted to be Utna. that too probably it was she looked at Utna and she was like man I wish I was you I don't know if I want to be with you or I want to be you so I'm gonna be with you because I can't be you. I, I believe t- cry about t- it. Tumblr's interpreted that as the tag uh, "life goals" or "wife goals." I mean, Whatever. T- shut no, up, I Tumblr. Was, I have a question. Okay. I'm gonna beat you up, all of Tumblr. <laughs> Since we're talking about that already, I want to ask: like, how much? Of, like, we already have said that this is a really bi show. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. So, like, how much of that? I mean, a lot of that is really just implicit. 
like it's the only explicit like uh, homo relationship is uh, Jury's interest in Shiori. Shiori. Uh, Shiori. No, they're. Um, don't you recall those few times when Toga and Akio were totes fucking? Right. Yeah. No. T- like, uh, taking pictures and, of each other shirtless on his car. No, like there was this. They, they, you know, they would zoom out in the shadow of them thrusting their hips into each other. Oh, I don't behind remember the curtain. Don't remember. You might not that. have. You might not have been able to tell that's what that was. I okay. didn't tell. But I that's what tell. that was. I don't okay. remember that I mean, scene, just... but I I remember th- them saying that like. <laughs> The ba- yeah, the Akio and Toga were definitely fucking. Like I remember, definitely. Okay, even but, I picked uh, up on that. Okay, I can. I l- thank you because <laughs> one of the things that I was bought that was bothering me. Well, one thing specifically in the okay. egg episode, there's mm-hmm. a joke I guess made when Toga is telling Nanami, uh, basically, God hates gays. And yeah. Oh, yeah. That, it, it's, a, it's supposed to be a joke because he's a hypocrite. Yeah. Because I mean, he's having sex with Akio. I mean, it just he's it still really bugged me. It still really bugged me and kind of threw me off of, uh, like, thinking about the show as uh, having a lot of bi characters and more like this is a lot of just uh, implicit Im- uh, imagery, but not really a lot of explicit actual stuff happening. No, I, I'm with no, Mina. I, I, I took that it, it as that it was, Toga being a two faced uh, piece of shit. It was Toga being a piece of shit. Okay. Um, remember, Ikuni he, loves to dress up as Sailor Mars. You know, like, th- that was Toga a being a Republican shit. senator. It, exactly. Okay. It was him just being a dick. Because, um, like, I have read, I believe I have read that Ikuni, like, part of, like, the his whole philosophy with this show is that, like, you know, men are impure, and any relationship with a man is going to be impure. So the only way to have a true, rela- pure relationship is with another woman. And it's like, that's problematic in its own ways, but yeah. it's interesting. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe I mean, he and I could get along. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Anyway, um, so yeah, Black Rose arc, we, we get more development with these characters, and also we get introduced to a very important character, kind of, um, with Akio, who we've been talking about. Akio is the... If you you lost track, he's uh, Super Devil Supreme. He is Anthony's older brother, and he's also the chairman to the school. Isn't he the acting acting chairman? The acting chairman. chairman. Because he's engaged to the chairman's daughter. And the chairman's, like, dying or whatever sick yeah. or something um and he, we see him just sort of mulling around doing mysterious things being weird and we're like what's up with this guy uh, and that's the most important stuff that happens in this arc i mean there's a lot of stuff if like if we want to do like a fucking dissertation on jury's fucking character then we're gonna have to like talk for a goddamn hour about the, the, these episodes with shiori and the water and the locket and the miracles yeah. and the blah 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 we haven't even started talking about the movie yet <laughs> i mean the movie i don't expect will take that long it's bad I will not. I will not calm down with the movie. I will not be nice to the movie. Okay, for, let's move on. I'll be to... nice to the movie for eight seconds because there are two scenes, two shots. It's third arc, Akio Otori Saga. So this is when like Akio is really like putting his foot in the mix. In my and basically, ass. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> he is end of the world. He's this guy that's been manipulating all this shit this entire time. He's the one who's asking everybody to duel. Why we're steadily learning why. And then the uh, point of this arc is that he wants everyone to basically kick Utna out of the champion seat. Yes. And why exactly did he want that? I th- because he wanted... Um, I think he wanted Toga to win because he... Because uh, he had his dick in Toga so he could manipulate him? Yeah, more mm-hmm. than Utna. Whereas Utna, he was slowly... Trying to get his dick in there. Trying to get his dick in there. <laughs> I like a gentleman. He literally <laughs> fucks his way to the top. That's yeah. Akio's strategy. To fuck his way to the top in all aspects of life. Sex is power in this show. It's always manipulative and evil. And it's like, it's like you'd think I would like this show better because it really does appeal to my uh, debilitating complexes. But no, I don't. 
Which was the first episode where you saw Anthe go up into the uh, observatory? Because that was that was a shock. I think it might have been in season two, actually. Like where toward the was, end, where it was very subtle. Where Utna was like, "Where do you go when you're not here?" And she's like, "Oh, I go to see my brother." And then mm-hmm. we see her, his, her brother being all posed on the couch and her taking her glasses off. Yeah, that was the first one. That was the first one. And, 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 and can I just say, like, there was a later episode where we saw her, like, lay down on the couch. The way she was posed made me physically sick. Like, th- that was yeah. powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was well done. It's, like, the, the, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I think the sad, the most dis- the most distressing part is when, like, was when it's just so blatantly obvious that even Choo Choo knows what's going on. Because like she leaves, because that's the only time she leaves Choo Choo behind, obviously. And Choo Choo's just like, and Udna's just like, Choo Choo, where's Anthony? And Choo Choo's just like, don't fucking ask me that. Like he just gives him this look, like, oh, no, I don't want to think about it. Choo Choo's my favorite character. Choo Choo's the best. <laughs> Um, okay. Is, um, is Choo Choo like the author's like the, the, <laughs> the artist's like OC or something? Because he's yes, weird. He's he got like is. a tie and an earring. Well, like, what? I have a theory. I think that he, part of it is that he's like sort of Ikuni stand-in, but part of it is that I think he's sort of like a little pathetic version of Akio because he's got the earring on the same ear and he wears the tie and he's purple. What? Oh, fuck. That oh is actually God. pretty Damn interesting. It. And if you look at like some of his interact, and notice how he's always, you know, he's always eating. You know how Aki is always trying to consume everything around him, and like hmm. how he's always with Anthe, and I don't know. That I mean, and if you notice at the end, at the very, very end, when um, Anthe leaves, Choo Choo takes off his earring and tie. So and also like I, says goodbye to a frog. What was that about? Yeah, I don't because know about that. Earlier in the, there was an episode oh. where he was having this fight with the frog that, like, sort of like paralleled, like, Akio being like, "I want the things," and then someone comes and takes it away from him. And he was like, "Why are you taking me away, my things?" Hmm. Are Did he fuck the frog? Things. Was it like the frog just <laughs> loved <laughs> Probably. It's very possible. <laughs> okay. Um, I so mean, was... other than, like, other than continuing character arcs of, like, the student council and stuff, what did the third arc actually do? Akio. Yes. We're like, oh, now we know who is in- responsible for all of this nonsense. Uh, and the other thing that was big in the third arc is, is that, um, was the third arc when they started living in the, uh, in, with Akio? Yeah, that's yes. when they moved in with him, too. Yeah, so they, every episode had those uh, scenes on the half-circle beds, which started, j- like, when they first, the first couple ones just grinded my ass into a fine powder, like, so effective, and, like, and so gay. And then after a certain point, I'm like, nothing's gonna fucking happen. I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get what I want out of this. I'm not gonna get anything <laughs> out of this. Show me the next goddamn scene. All right. They also the uh, third arc also had the uh, scenes with uh, Akio driving them into the end of the world. Yeah, and at this point, he's taking a very active role, and he's you know, you know he's he's teaming up with Toga, and Toga's like, "You have problems? Let me show you this cool car." Those were some great scenes, like when the car just appears out of the fountain. Yeah, the Toga shirt just comes open for no reason. But uh, the reason for and the car... Ev- every time I was he flipped over the hood, I was hoping he would completely eat shit and break his <laughs> Um I- Ikuhara has actually explained the car, and to him it's like, you know, when he was coming up with the show, he saw that specific model of car. I'm mean, not a car person. Well, worth noting, it's an imported car. The yes. the, okay. the steering wheel's on the left side, so it's an American car. And this it's is supposed a- to note that he's very rich, a okay. luxurious guy. Also, he has a car phone, which is silly now, but at the time, it's like, whoa, this dude is fucking, fucking the, like this. Sh- this show was made during the fourteenth month period in which car phones were extant. 
<laughs> I mean, it's also like <coughs> obviously like symbol of adulthood or maturity that uh, exactly. Like well, you know, Ikuhara yeah. saw the car and he's like, "That looks like a very adult object." See, see what this I thing just looks like what it, an adult, not in. Not, but adult, not in like the actual like maturity of like being like a sensible person who's like grown and makes sense of the world, but adult in like this very superficial sense of like having these possessions, having this attitude, having this sense of power and this sense of agency. I mean, you know, a car takes you from point A to point B. I know. saw it as a uh, as um, macho bullshit posturing. That, that is too. also that very, is very much part true. Of it. Yeah, I figured it was just another dick. Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, also another dick. Every single time he asked, "Do you enjoy the feel of the engine underneath you, or something like that?" You like, like this dick on my, you like my <laughs> dick on your butt? Like, because <laughs> not even it's, it's like on. a corrupted adulthood. You know, he's trying to say, you know, adulthood is all about being the best, being powerful, <sighs> having sex. You know, With and fourteen-year-old boys. How old yes. is Toga supposed... They're, like, in middle school, right? But, like, it's Japan, well, so... Utna is in middle school. I think some of the student council are supposed to be in high school. Mickey yeah. is in definitely in middle school. Mickey is yeah. three years old. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're all very young. Um, they're young and seven feet tall and just ready to take on the world. Also important in this arc is that Utna starts to fall in love with Akio. Well, um, when does she ever, like, understand that Akio is the prince from before? Or, like, or I know no. that she does... Oh, no? I don't think so. Because at first her reservation is that, like, I'm saving myself for the prince. Because, you know, she's this very naive, idyllic person. Yeah. And she's like, this guy is super hot and charming me and, and all my lady parts and I can't control it. And she, like, eventually is just, like, that's why, like, the thing with the candles flickering is, like, her, like, reserve of being, like, no, I'm going to be pure and oh, right, that. save myself for the prince, but I, I like this guy, even mm. though I, there's so many reasons why she shouldn't, both reasons she knows of and doesn't know of. I mean, I thought that the candles flickering were uh, Anthe's trust in her or something like that, since it always seemed to, like, focus on Anthe when a uh, candle flicked out. Well, maybe. Maybe. You know what? I think everybody's right. I think everybody... You know what? Everybody gets a trophy. I'm sorry. Go <laughs> what, was the the th- what, was, what was even the thesis of that? Did you just feel like being a, t- being a dick? I, listen, I need to vent. You need to put a dunce cap on... Go into the corner and think about what you did. <laughs> oh, my God. You're ruining everyone else's fun. No, he's not. Don't no, he's, no. he's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that might have ruined my fun slightly. What? Okay, that was whatever. pretty good. Um. So yeah, Utna is falling in love with Akio. Akio is the. He literally does say. Nikki says Akio is the devil. Nikki is not wrong on that front. He is literally the devil. His name is a Japanese version of Luc- Morning Star or Lucifer. So you know. You and he see. tells us to Utna, and she's like, wow, you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, it is worth is like, noting that I, I call, like, I call maybe one out of every five people I meet the devil. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you like have a to, fucking mom from Waterboy. Well, you have to be right eventually. I mean, you're just going to see the <laughs> devil and say, hey, you're the devil. Yeah. And then, finally, we get to the Apocalypse Saga. You know, things are finally well, wrapping up somehow. Before that, there was the clip show. Oh, well, the second yeah, clip show. falling in love with Akio. That was the third clip show. The second one was the, Suwa- the Suwabaki one. Yes. Oh, shit, you're with right. With his diary. I yeah. That. yeah. I forgot. I forgot. It was funny because everybody saw his penis. His his little middle his little elementary school wiener yeah. the baby dick. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't show it because usually the Japanese find small children's penises hilarious. I mean they're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, they're not. It's, it's, it's great. It's it's they're the mo- they're the funniest thing. I'm, I still I need to ask Alex to, if he's still keeping track of how many times Goku's little boy penis shown in Dragon Ball because I told it's him a, to keep track of it. It's adorable. Like it's a baby. <laughs> 
Um, but actually, the, one, uh, one thing I, I, I hinted at this when I was going through how like every male character sucks. But the thing that Suwabaki said, there was a uh, uh, Suwabaki heavy episode where somebody asked him, like, "So what? You think you're just going to be nice to her, and eventually she'll fall in love with you?" No, I know that's stupid, but I'm just going to keep hanging around with her because I like her or whatever. So it's like. <laughs> he knows the friend zone is friend zone is bullshit, but he's just gonna hang out there. Yep. Yeah. Because he hasn't grown up yet. But he's still smarter than everybody else. Than everyone, literally everyone. Yeah. Uh, the, the 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 third clip show, the brutal one. Yeah. Um. It, uh. The the interstitial bits in between the clips uh, are. Of well, Utna. it starts off with uh, it starts off with Akio talking to the chorus girls on their radio station. Uh, I was oh, is that the same daily. episode? Yeah. yeah, it yeah. starts off with him in the car. Yeah. Uh, um... Well, he was actually talking to. Uh, it was uh, talking to Anthe about what they were doing uh, that day. I think. Yeah. I mean, I remember that it was there was definitely a conversation with Anthe. And it was we only saw one side of it because yeah. the other side was uh, Utna in the car with uh, Akio coming back from a romantic date. Apparently, yeah, they went to make a delivery. Um, it was just Akio's excuse to go out on like a little rendezvous with Utna at some went to, little like, resort town. Yeah, they went to like a little amusement park and then stayed in a hotel. Um. And so, so the interstitial bits are a lot of Una just talking about what a great day she had. But I mean, if we can just skip to the scene, she's lying on her bed, trying to think of what she's going to have for lunch the next day, getting kind of really stressed out about it, and then worrying about uh, Anthe. Yeah, worrying, worrying about, about An- having enough food to feed Anthe. And then we see like this shot of her fingers interlinked. With, with Akio's. Akio's in a position that's only possible if he's on top of her. So you, it's, so then you realize she's having this whole quandary about what to eat for lunch tomorrow while this man who's three times as old as she is is in her. Actually, even older. He's like a, a million years old. Fuck. But yes. Wow. I was so mad. Like, like, I mean... Like, it was a, it, like I'll give this sh- this show credit for it. It produced such a visceral emotional reaction in me, something like like of almost unparalleled severity. Good on you, show, for making me feel that strongly about something, especially as I was losing interest in all of your characters. I mean, I figured out that he was there when she had said we spent too long fooling around last night, but even then, that scene still hit me. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a very powerful scene. I remember when we watched it in club, everyone was silent because it's it's a very oddly shot scene because you know it's just closing up on her face and she's just talking about this random crap and you're like, what? Why? What is what is happening? What is going on? And then like, and it was like the only time in club where nobody's talking. And then of course you know the punch hits and you're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. Never gonna, never gonna have salmon, asparagus, and an omelet <laughs> at the same time again. <laughs> so then we're moving on to finally the end of this parade, the apocalypse. This arc, rigmarole. Where you this know, ordeal? Things are finally. More things are revealed. We find out what actually happened to Utna the day her parents died. We find out the the formal story of the Prince of the Rose. You know, it's told by our favorite chorus girls. They get go a, guy, go guy, go guy. <laughs> <laughs> they get a point to be really important and like actually be like, no, this is the fucking story. See how the spotlight is shining on this character when we're talking about this character and our story. We're we're not fucking around. Also, we're real. Did you guys know we were real? We're real now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Udna real... responded to them every now and then, so... Yeah, it was... Awesome. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that, because I loved them, but I also loved how detached they were, but then they got more and more attached, but I, they're they're too fucking adorable for me to hate. I love them I so mean, they much. still weren't you. very attached to the story. It was just really, really adorable side uh, 
Side they gave, episode. like, the most, the most important and possibly only legitimate exposition in the show. <laughs> no, they definitely did, because, like, this was the thing that I, I said when I was rewatching the finale yesterday. It's like, I would like anime so much better if any character ever gave a straightforward answer to any question they were ever asked. It never happens. No anime has ever had that happen. That's very, honestly, that's very true. A lot of the conflict and, like, keeping people invested comes from just straight up not telling anyone anything so that you have to reveal it later. But it's like, yeah, but naturally somebody would have to be like, no, fucking stop. I just asked you what's going on. Now somebody fucking tell me what's going on. <laughs> and, like, this is one of those things, like, I was thinking, you know, when, 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 when Utna was in possession of the Rose Bride, you know, Anthony had to do whatever she... Anthony. Anthony. Anthony had to do... I mean, you're not off. It's the same here's, here's, root. Greek yeah. root. means flower. Yeah. Uh, a- Anthony would have to do whatever she said. So, Una could have just asked, what the fuck does it mean to be the Rose Bride? And we could have learned it. But that's the thing. That didn't actually matter to U- Una. That's what we sort of learned. I, I figured that I she mean, would... Like, I mean, I get that. I get that enough. It did sometimes, though. Because sometimes she was legit like, like, what's going on? Like, she didn't care. But at the same time, someone sometimes she was just like, like, what the hell is that? And, like, nobody would just... Fight, no one well, would and then that. Anthony just wouldn't want to answer. She didn't care, but she did these 28 sword fights. So ev- evidently she cared a little bit. No, she cared because being engaged to the Rose Bride allowed her to be what she wanted, which is That's a true. prince. That's yeah, like so I, I she get was it. Getting I, what she wanted. I think it worked. I, I, overall, I do think it worked. It's just one of those. It's just one of those storytelling elements that's like. And she's like, so fucking her head's caught up in the clouds, space cadet. She has absolutely no idea the gravitas of any of this shit. Like basically, the the conversation we're basically having right now is why the fuck didn't Gilligan just build a boat? Okay, he, since we're kind of nudging up against the other complaint I had, like with storytelling, Anthe. It is, uh, I mean, it's Utna's story, but she never really takes any kind of action in it. Like, she's always reacting to other characters, like, putting, like, her in a position to actually do stuff. But she's never actually taking the story into her own hands until the very end. Yeah, like, and I, feel I think like... that's, I, I think part of that is because the, at the, the very end, surprise, it was about Anthe all along. Basically, was what the ending was, I felt. Yeah, I mean, it's about, like we said, we were, well, we, you know, when we were talking about Anthe earlier, she's all of these stereotypes. She's all of these labels, all of these roles. So she is very important. Like, she is important, but Utna is, like, the protagonist of the story, and I feel, mm-hmm. like, it felt really weird to not have a really, for the protagonist to be so passive. Like, to. I think that, that was the of, point, though. I mean, yeah. that was the point, but it's like all of these other characters are somehow more important to the main story than the protagonist, and yet the protagonist is still there for some reason. She's there because she's the perfect candidate, because she's so naive. She succeeds because she truly believes in the myth of the prince. She didn't succeed, though. Like, that was she didn't the succeed end. because it's impossible, because it's a myth. It doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. And she never got that. Even at the very end, she never realized it. Maybe that's my main problem, because, like, I could I could get behind that, but because Udna was the protagonist, like, I latched onto her, and I was believing yeah. with her, and then the very yeah. end, just like, oh, well, well yeah, fuck. I mean, it's supposed to hurt when the world comes crashing around it, you. Like, it, it hurt, but at the same, it, it hurt for a second, but then, you know, I'm not actually Utna, so then I'm just sitting there as an audience member, like, well, what the fuck did I just watch then? Okay. Can we, can we go through, the, can we go through the ending, or do you have something you want to say before that, Nina? Um, I just have this one quote from the ending, uh, one of the ending bits, exchanges between Anthe and Utna, that I was trying to say earlier, but I got sidetracked, but, um, so it starts with Utna. And she says, Himemia, you're type AB, right? Let's see. Type ABs are elusive and seldom reveal their true feelings, huh? And then <laughs> Anthe says, and you're type B, right, Utna-sama? Type Bs are self-centered and prone to misconceptions. <laughs> well, so- says, sometimes uh, Anthony's Anthe is fucking ruthless. Yes. Yeah. Because she just doesn't get 
take it. She, her job is to eat shit all day long. <laughs> That's her job. You know, and sometimes she's just like, mm-mm. <laughs> But yeah, I think that's one of those like really telling exchanges that like you miss it and you're like, oh, that's actually kind of important. Because like towards the end, they're sort of growing apart from each other because of Akio. And then they come back together in the end and they're like, you know, Anthe's like, you know, I've been using you. And then Utena was like, I've been using you. And, you know, and they sort of like come to some sort of like realization about each other or like how they view each other really like because they're like do we do we actually even care about each other like what were we doing this whole time that was a really good moment yeah that was yeah. probably my, one of my favorite moments of the series because it actually felt like something there was it actually felt like okay this is it this is an arc and it's been like this is good i love it like good like yay i loved it It was great go, uh, go how was how again was Anthe using Utna? Um, well, she was she was manipulating her as part of Akio's plan, because Anthe is his tool, and she is willingly his tool. You know, she has the ability to leave, kind of, but she went along with everything, not really with much concern for Utna how Utna turned out in all of it. And that's why she felt guilty because she was going to throw herself off of the building because she's like, I can't take this anymore. This person is too like innocent and I'm going to destroy her. And I don't want to do that. So the, the ending. Okay. Utna goes up to the battlefield with Anthe to meet Akio. And End of the world who she didn't know was Akio the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Akio reveals that the battlefield that all of these fights have taken place on is an illusion created by his observatory. So, all right, we'll put that in our pocket. That's coming back out. Uh, Utna pulls her sword out of Anthe's chest, and Akio pulls a sword out of Utna's for him to use? Am I right? Um, I think so, because... Okay, so- because the sword of Dios got displaced from Anthe to Utna because Utna was getting more and more powerful, so she was holding the the source of the power. That's what the duels do. The duels displace the power from Anthe to the engaged for the end of the world to get from the engaged. Okay, I don't know where you got that, but I'll, I'll buy it. Because it'll, it'll at least that's, explain why Anthony started pulling it out of Utna instead of the other way around. Yeah, that seemed um, like a neat progression. It's the first I've heard of it, but all right. Uh, so they sword fight for a bit. Then Anthe stabs Utna. I don't know where she got her sword. Because like, where whose kitty did she pull that out of? Akio's? <laughs> it's the only one left. <laughs> but whatever. So how, with Utna... Dead. Apparently, that allows Akio to access this Rose Gate, which is right off of the battlefield. And here's where I start getting, I start pointing shit out. Is that this battle, <laughs> this battlefield is illusory. It's all in the fucking tower. It's all made up. But this Rose Gate bridge thing, oh, that's real because he, this is where this is what he's been trying to get to the whole time. He crosses over it and uh, like 300 million swords that represent all the hatred of the world, which I guess is, I guess it would be 3 billion because it's every man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they all uh, start coming up and they uh, go into Anthe because I guess they would have gone into Akio if Anthe wasn't there. I don't know why, but there we go. So well, I didn't g- you pay attention to the story before? I tried to, but they didn't really explain. No, the they didn't story explain it. They didn't much. explain a single goddamn thing. Anthe is floating up in the air while the above this illusory battlefield that is apparently just the 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 observatory tower being stabbed by seven million swords. Which I guess would have to also be illusory, otherwise they would be like tearing up the school. So that's a thing. And like she's not dying, so this is all like I guess symbolic, but 
so I, I here's the thing is at this point I have no idea what the fuck is actually happening. He goes Akio goes up to this rose gate. He's trying to break it open with the sword he pulled out of Utna's titty. The sword of Dios. Sword of Dios. Which I guess got more powerful because it was was like being forged in her over these duels. Is that why there needs to be so many fucking duels? Yes. Probably. All right. So he's trying to break open this gate. Doesn't work. Sword breaks and like, oh, didn't work. I guess we'll try again next year. And then Utna b- stabbed, d- drags herself over to the gate while... Uh, Akio's just lying on his side drinking of sex on the beach, which is honestly the, like the least offensive thing in this scene. It's like, all right, that's that's like abstract. I can just put that over there. That's fine. He's just drinking a fruity <laughs> drink, whatever. That's not important. <laughs> and then, so Una goes up to this gate that's like covered in in thorns and vines and everything. And did she just open it? Did she just like pull it open? It's her. Yeah. All right, and then. She forces it open, and then Anthe goes from being up in the sky, being stabbed by a bunch of pretend real swords, and then she's naked inside the coffin, and it's like, oh, I guess you're free now, despite the fact that if you had, if you were willingly the Rose Bride, you could have been free the the whole time, and then everything starts falling down, because the swords are destroying the place, and the coffin or whatever that, that, uh, Anthe's in, falls through these, I guess, again, illusory clouds, and then Utn is destroyed by these swords who, at this point, I've given up trying to understand if they're real or not. So I guess she dies. But then later, we're like, we see everybody, like, moving on. It's like, oh, Suba- uh, uh, Togan and Sionji are friends again. Nanami's kind of calmed down. Uh, Su- Suwabaki and, and Mickey, your friends. Kotsue is being maybe less of a frigid, but admittedly sexually agent bitch about everything. And, and then we see Anthony talking to Aki, and I was like, oh, I guess we gotta, I'm rewriting the rules for the duel so that I don't get fucked up this time, and this time it's definitely gonna work. And, and Anthony says, you know, Utna's not dead. I don't know how she would, Utna's not dead. She's just not in this world that you can see anymore. I don't know how Anthony can determine that because she, you know, I mean, she fell out of the fucking sky. She should be dead too. And, and, (laughs) and Utna got destroyed by 400 million swords. And then she like leaves the school. There's this montage over the credits of her just walking through all these areas, which Nina thought it was really important for me to look at a different video to see it, because the version on the Noisement YouTube account didn't have it, and I don't get what the fucking point was. Uh, she's walking. I already saw her left the school. I don't need to see her walk through a bunch of still backgrounds. So, so what my question is, what actually happened and what was pretend metaphorical bullshit yes i think the biggest problem is when they revealed the illusory stuff because that kind of like it pokes holes in everything i mean no that fucks with your idea of what's real and what's not because before you were able to just like accept that this forest held an entire like arena and castle hanging from the sky yeah it was magical like i i could i could buy that yeah, and yeah, then it, once the illusion stuff happens, you're saying, oh, now everything has to be from an illusion. Like, I think having that projector be there is what's fucking up the uh, idea of the story for you. Because I think the projector is just, like, the projector is the most, like, symbolic thing there. Because it's not, like, even if it is an actual projector there, it's like, that's just saying how bullshit the whole story is. Like, it's not... Like, the whole, the rest of the whole thing could be magical. It doesn't, like, the projector being there doesn't make everything real life, I think. Does that make any sense? I, I get what you're saying, but, but what, what, what the fuck is the Rose Gate? What okay. is it? Okay, I'm gonna start. Okay, thank you. Start, Please. Thank you. And I'm gonna help. I'm gonna do my best. Pass the mic. To give you hot. my interpretation. I have to take off my socks. I'm so, sweating. Okay, so what? So mad. So, question number one. What the hell was Akio after at all in the first place? Uh, another good question. <laughs> he was after the power of the prince. Because in that flashback, or in that story when we see Dios approach Utna and tell her all these stories about the prince and, and blah blah blah. 
we learned that, you know, once upon a time, there actually was this magical prince guy who helped everyone, all the world's women, and he grew tired and exhausted. And all these people were demanding him to, you know, do the things you're responsible for doing. He's a dios. He's a god. And he was having trouble coping with being divine. He couldn't handle it. So Anthe, his sister, who loves him in her way, I mean, not that she wants to fuck him, but that, like, she, you know, admires him and, like, is her brother. It's like, you know, you have to rest. You're going to die. I'll go out and I'll talk to them. So she goes out to these people and they deem her a witch. And how do they make that conclusion again? Because she's saying, go away, please leave him alone. And they're like, no, how could you say that? We need him. We need him to save us. They see her as responsible for him being locked away rather than his own choice. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, they blame her. They blame her. And, and she she's takes like, the blame. So when that happens... Oh, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to say one little thing. You mentioned that, you know, like, yeah, and Auntie loves Dios. Oh, it doesn't want to fuck her. And this is the only show where you'd have to specify that. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Any other show we could just assume it's familial love. A very simple concept that everybody on Earth understands. Yeah. So she takes all of the so all of the hate that Dios the god should be getting for relinquishing his duties as a god, she receives. She receives that burden. And because of that, she also receives his power. So Akio is sort of this version of Dios that doesn't have the power of Dios. And what he wants is the power without any of the responsibility. And that's what the duels are for. It's, and, but what's behind the rose gate is the power, which Anthe holds. But if he takes it directly from her, then he gets all of that punishment for denying it, the responsibility. So that's why he needs to do this rigmarole to transfer it to one person, to take it to, from that one person while Anthe's taking all of the responsibility of his mistakes so he can just get the power so he can enjoy himself and live in this lavish life. So that's what he wants. Um, and that's what the gate is. And Anthe is actually the only one who has Eddie, the actual power. That's why he has to control her. Because she, as the witch, and as like this conduit for all of this responsibility and all of this hate and all of these swords and all this shit, she is the only one that can actually do anything. Because the power of Dios lives within her in that sword. And um, Akio can't just take it. Because if he takes it, then he takes that burden on himself. As he deserves. And Anthony continues to do this because, one, she's been doing it for millennia. And when you've endured something for a long time, it's kind of hard to imagine not enduring it. It just becomes second nature to you. And two, she once upon a time did care about her brother and wanted to alleviate this pain from him. But it's just sort of gotten out of control. And now because he no longer has his responsibilities to be a good person, he's just fucking everyone and doing whatever the hell that he wants. And she's sort of resigned herself that this is just the only way things are going to be because she just doesn't believe that she can do anything, even though the reality is she is the only one who can actually change things. So that's why she stabs Utna, because, like, she's still under his influence. She still, she doesn't believe that Utna will change anything. She doesn't believe that this will ever stop. She's afraid of what will happen if the cycle breaks, because all she's ever known is this cycle. As terrible as it is, it's her life. That's what she has. The last time she went out and did something, you know, outside of her comfort zone, she got stuck in this crap. She got stabbed to death by all these people. Why is she going to leave and go out to the real world? Even though this fake world is terrible, like, you know, it's an abuse victim thing. You know, when you're a victim of abuse, like you're stuck in it and you can't imagine anything outside of it. And so sometimes you can be really 
hurtful to the people who are trying to help you. Get out of it. So Akio wants this Dios power from Utna, and he's been manipulating her this whole time. And, and part of what comes crumbles during this scene is the myth of the prince. Utna this whole time has thought that being the prince is the greatest thing ever. And we realize that it's just a bunch of bullcrap because there is no such thing as a prince that can save everybody without there being some sort of darker side to it. And her wanting to be the prince was for her to fulfill her own sort of ego, for her to feel like she had a reason to be alive because, you know, after her parents died, she didn't want to be alive. But then she got this dream and she was like, oh, this is my purpose now. This is what I want to be. And it's all just a fantasy. It's all just a ruse to manipulate people and make them buy into these systems and these binaries that only hurt everyone around them. Um, and we see that, that, you know, the prince, even when it was pure, it was never truly pure because looming on the horizon was this inevitable decline of it because something like that isn't sustainable because something like that just cannot be. Um, so Akio takes the sword or the power and he tries to take to claim the power of Dios while Anthe is taking all the responsibility of the hatred of, of being a god, basically. Because, you know, he wants to be a god without actually having to deal with the shit of being a god. Um, and the reason why, like, reality and fantasy is blending, it is very vague, it is very confusing, it's not very specific. The reason why Anthe is behind the coffin is because she is actually what Dios is at this point. Like, she is the, actually the one who has the power of Dios. And she's sort of sealed back there. Her t true self is sealed back there. Like, we have, there's this theory that behind that um, coffin or whatever, that's like the real Anthe. And whatever we've been seeing this whole time is some kind of projection because she has these powers. We've seen her be able to, like, look like other people and fuck with people's brains. She has these abilities. Um, so like, yes, it's, it's all, it's all symbolic. You know, she's not literally falling from the sky and dying. It's saying, you know, and Utna, meanwhile, and all this crap, it's still sort of above her, but she sort of realizes that Anthe, you know, needs help for like her own good and now it's not because Utna wants to be the hero it's because she actually is like concerned for Anthe at this point she has nothing left but to try to help Anthe so she reaches out a hand to Anthe to say look this doesn't have to be the way things are you don't have to be stuck in here you don't have to play this stupid game um but she doesn't grab hold because Utna's only one person and ultimately, it's Anthe who has to make the decision. So when Anthe falls away, it's sort of like saying that, like, Utna doesn't have the power herself. That's not where all this is coming from. She has the power to make Anthe believe that she can change herself, but she can't actually do it herself because people have to make up their own minds about their lives. You can't rescue somebody. Being a prince is a lie because you can't go into someone's life and save them from themselves, no matter how hard you try, unless that person wants it and that person responds to it. So that's why, you know, when Anthe, when all is said and done, Anthe leaves because she finally realizes that there's something else and she doesn't want to do it anymore. And Utna reaching out her hand made her see that finally. And what happened to Utna, that I'm not as entirely sure, but I almost feel like it's sort of Utna helping to bear the burden that Anthe has been having to bear this whole time. And because Utna is just a regular person, it sacrifices a lot more than Anthe does because she's like this ageless goddess thing. So that's what I think happened. And then in the movie, it's sort of them finding each other again and coming to, to each other on like an equal f playing field and sort of Anthe rescuing Utna the way that Utna sort of rescued but didn't rescue her. Does that help? It actually really does. Um, I have a couple of questions. So like when she opened the door, did she get the power of Dios? 
Is that why the swords attacked her? Um, I think so. Like, she helped... Yeah, because whoever opens that gets the power of Dio. So I think she got some of that, and that's part of why she was able to open it. Because Akio couldn't open it because he only had, like, a fal- false power, I guess. Because he's, an, he's like, a dick. He doesn't deserve the power. But Utna's, like, actually, like... Well, he was using Utna's sword. And yeah. that's why he wasn't able to open it. You can't right. use a sword to open a door, silly. That was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> use your hands, moron. So Utna just <laughs> opens it and is like... I need to do this. Like, just, See, well, Yuna has... just opens it. It's like, it's no big deal. Just use your hands. <laughs> it's a fucking door, bro. <laughs> she's grown a lot, and she's gained a lot of strength, and she has gained the power of the prince. I mean, that's why her hair is pink with the fucking color symbol is, again, power and princeliness. So, like, she does it. She does what Akio couldn't do because she's a better person than he is. So did she die? Or... <laughs> Um, I like, think... I th- okay, she got stabbed I, a bunch! Well, the way those I took... <laughs> those knives are pretend. They're figurative. I mean, I mean, the way the- that I took the ending was just that she died in the sense of, like, she was removed from the fairy tale that yes. Akio had set up around the school. Like, exactly. Because the school was starting to forget Utna because she was no longer part of their world anymore. Yeah, because in, in Akio's world, he can controls everything, including what people think and believe. Because Utna sort of transcended his bullshit, she no longer existed in it. So she disappeared. That's why Anthe was like, she's not dead. She's dead to you because you're the one in this happy little dreamland creating this shit. But she's out there in some place that's beyond this fairy tale bullcrap. I'm going to find her and I'm done with you. And we're gonna and we're gonna be a car, and it's gonna be great. Yeah, <laughs> and we're gonna find a real fantasy or a, a real dream to chase, something that we can actually believe in. And that's, that's a fucking ourselves. dream, all right. Fucking fever dream. So, so that movie that was a really good a really good explanation of the ending. Thank you, Nina. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess, like, I I feel like again, it's like sometimes when I, when we watch shit, like, I can't solidify my opinion and then we talk it out and I'm like I I come away from recordings feeling a lot better about this. I feel that way about Uta now. Like I it was weird. Like I agree with everything you said and I feel like I I, I guess like either the show just if it was just a little just slightly just a nudge a smidgen more uh, explanatory just a bit. I, I, you know I, at I, all I which, is, which really is to say at all. If it would have just explained, like, well, no, maybe like, one thing. Like, if it would have everything told me that... one thing, and then I could have maybe pieced the rest rest together. Because it's well, like, it told um... told you about the witches. It... The nature of the witch, the princess, and the Okay, prince. to be fair, I was falling asleep during that Kashida scene. Okay. I was completely on my ass. The story of, like, the story of the show is really straightforward until the very end. And I think that's what the problem is. I was informed that, like, nothing would make sense... Until the end. The exact opposite is the truth. Yeah. Everything makes sense until the end. Mo- everything mostly makes sense. I mean, who is that... Who is that, like, ghost motherfucker? That doesn't make sense. Don't don't you dare look me in the eye and tell me that ghost motherfucker made sense. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just Akio f- fucking around. and I, I Like I said, I think it's just to show that he controls reality in this world. Yeah, they didn't do they didn't do a good enough job explaining that. Yeah. Was like, I just thought like he faded away, and I was like, oh, and then everybody forgot, and the building was actually burned down, and I was like, oh, and then no one remembered, and I was like, oh, and then everybody just this the, the just show kept going, on. and I went wait, yeah, and then what? The, and then the next episode, Nanami turned into a cow, and I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> well, I'm back on board. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I don't need to worry about what that shit was. Um, so yeah, I think after that monologue of yours, Nina. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm not trying to like disparage you. I'm just saying it took you 20 minutes to explain what the fuck this show is about. Um, I think I'm going to come away with this in a similar way that I came away with Fully Cooley, and that I now largely get it. I still don't totally get it the way that like I get to Fully Cooley. I um, don't. I think it's impossible to totally get it. It's this. Yeah, it's so, just this bizarre piece of art. So now I, I, I'm no longer going to walk away from this saying that it was just a bunch of bullshit. I still don't like it. And I don't think that's just, that's not going to change. That's totally fair. <laughs>